Uh, today we're going to be uh, finishing our series on the book of Acts and today we're going to be looking at the last few chapters there in Acts detailing Paul's arrest, his imprisonment and the various trials before kings and governors. Last week I ended with Paul leaving the Ephesian elders and sailing towards Jerusalem and he was eager to make the Pentecost Pilgrim Festival at the temple in Jerusalem and we're told by Luke that at every port that he stops on on his journey they're warned that imprisonment awaits Paul and there's a debate between scholars at this point uh, in Acts as to whether Paul is obeying or disobeying the spirit and this is because um, part of um, when we encounter the word spirit here it's without the definite article it's without the the and so we're left wondering if it's the believers are telling Paul not to go to Jerusalem in their spirit, um, i.e. they don't want to see their friends arrested, or in the spirit, as in the Holy Spirit, telling him not to go. Uh, Paul, however, in Acts 21.13 says this, For I am ready not only to be tied up, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. So Paul's ready to die if, so if it should be. They eventually arrive in Jerusalem and they're told that the brothers welcomed us gladly. And so they've had a very good reception as they've arrived in Jerusalem. And in Acts 21, 19 through to 20, we read, When Paul had greeted them, he began to explain in detail what God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard this, they praised God. Then they said to him, you see, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are who've believed and they're all ardent observers of the law. So this is great news. Paul tells them that many non-Jews are, are now following this Jewish Messiah and the God of Israel. And in return, James tells Paul, and this James is the brother of Jesus, the leader of the church in Jerusalem. He informs him that thousands of Jews have now accepted that Jesus is indeed the Messiah. And they're all these ardent observers of Torah, the law of Moses. A rumour, however, has started circulating that Paul is breaking Torah. He's breaking Jewish law. And James suggests that Paul should show that the rumours are false by going to the temple by pray, paying for the sacrificial offerings and ritual purification rites for a number of the Jewish believers, uh, as well as his own, because, you know, he made that vow earlier. Now he's um, having to shave his head and stuff. So Paul happily agreed and he went the very next day to the temple. We read in verse 26, then Paul took uh, the men the next day and after he had purified himself along with them, he went to the temple and gave notice of the completion of the days of purification when the sacrifice should be offered for each of them. So the rumours perhaps started circulating because Paul is not encouraging those who accept the Jewish Messiah to become Jews. Rather, he's told them to remain non-Jews and yet worship the God of Israel rather than obeying all of the Torah all of the law, but rather obeying only the parts mentioned in Acts 15 regarding the goi um, or those rules relating to strangers living among you or resident aliens uh, within the land of Israel. And so, you know, for people outside the context, they might be thinking, well, you know, he's going to the Gentiles and he's telling them not to obey the law of Moses and things like that. You know, so you can see why uh, the rumours might have started circulating. And it all comes to a head in Acts 21, uh, verses 27 to 30, when we read, When the seven days were almost over, the Jews from the province of Asia, who had seen him in the temple area, stirred up the whole crowd, and they seized him, shouting, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who teaches everyone everywhere against our people, our laws, and this sanctuary. Furthermore, he's brought Greeks into the inner courts of the temple and made this holy place ritually unclean. For they had seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, in the city with him previously, and they assumed that Paul had brought him into the inner temple courts. The whole city was stirred up and the people rushed together. They seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple courts, and immediately the doors were shut. Notice that it's Jews here from Turkey 
who were also on pilgrimage in Jerusalem at the temple, who started the riot. These are people probably aware of Paul's ministry, that he's not converting non-Jews to Judaism as they would like him to be doing. Also, they make an incorrect assumption here that Paul has broken the law by allowing Trophimus into the temple. This is a false accusation. Paul hasn't done that. Uh, Paul, however, is arrested and he's taken to the Roman barracks. And the Roman commanding officer, however, permits Paul to address the crowd. And so Paul has this opportunity in order to defend himself. And he says this, that he's a Jew, that he's trained by Gamaliel, one time president of the great Sahedrin in Jerusalem. And to this day, you know, is held in highest regards by rabbinical Jews. And Paul explains that he once persecuted the followers of Jesus. But then, like the prophets of old, he had received a calling via an encounter with Jesus as this bright light upon the road to Damascus. And Paul, in his speech, goes to great lengths to point out that the Jewish followers of Jesus are all Torah observant Jews, that they're all continuing to obey the law of Moses. So he says of Ananias in verse 12 that he's a devout man according to the law, well spoken by all the Jews who live there. And then he recalls in Acts 22, 17 to 21, he says this, When I returned to Jerusalem, I was praying in the temple. I fell into a trance and the Lord saying to me, hurry and get out of Jerusalem quickly because they will not accept your testimony about me. I replied, Lord, they themselves know that I've been imprisoned and beat those in various synagogues who believed in you. And when the blood of your witness Stephen was shed, I myself was standing nearby, approving and guarding the cloaks of those who were killing him. And then he said to me, go, because I send you far away to the Gentiles. So Paul here reveals to the crowd that he encountered Jesus again in the Jewish temple whilst he was praying. And that he was told to go and preach to the Gentiles, to the non-Jews. And that is part of his calling. So following this incident, Paul explains to the Romans that he is indeed a Roman citizen and therefore he's got all these additional rights and privileges. And Paul then is taken to the great Sanhedrin, this highest court in Jewish law. And we read in Acts 23, 6 to 11. And when Paul noticed that part of them were Sadducees and others were Pharisees, he shouted out in the council, brother, I am a Pharisee, the son of Pharisees, and I'm on trial concerning the hope of the resurrection from the dead. And when he said this, an argument between the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the assembly was divided. For the Sadducees say there's no resurrection or angels or spirit, but the Pharisees acknowledged them all. And there was a great commotion. Some experts in the law from the party of the Pharisees stood up and they protested strongly. We find nothing wrong with this man. What if an angel or a spirit has spoken to him? And when the argument became so great, the commanding officer feared that they would tear Paul to pieces. He ordered the detachment to go down, take him far away by force and bring him into the barracks. The following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, have courage, for just as you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. So in this passage, we see within the great Sanhedrin, and uh, many who are even willing to defend Paul at this moment. So Paul describes himself as a Pharisee, the son of Pharisees. And some of that party, you know, won't even agree with Paul's testimony. You know, they say, what if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him? You know, they're even willing to accept his story about the light on the way to Damascus and stuff. So Paul has had his defenders, and I'm sure many of them might have known him prior to this encounter, since he had been Gamaliel's student. So we're also told that the Lord Jesus here stood near Paul once again and said to him, Have courage, for just as you've testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify in Rome. So this is Paul's third, perhaps, encounter just within the book of Acts here with the risen Lord Jesus you know so once on the road to Damascus once um, in the Jewish temple and then here again amongst the Sanhedrin and so following this there's a number of Jews swear an oath that they're going to kill Paul uh, but the Romans are getting word of a plot via Paul's nephew and so Paul is taken to the governor Felix who then sends him to Herod 
to be kept safe. Well, at least to his prison. And Paul's opponents accuse him of being a troublemaker, desecrating the temple. And the Roman governor, Felix, asks for Paul to respond. And so he replies in Acts 24, 14 and 15. But I confess this to you, that I worship the God of our ancestors according to the way which they call a sect. Believing everything that is in accordance with the law and that is written in the prophets. I have a hope in God. I hope that these men themselves accept too. That there is going to be a resurrection of both the righteous and the unrighteous. And Paul explains here that he is a Jew who accepts the Torah and the prophets. But he's on trial because of his hope in the resurrection. And so we see here that Felix, who has a Jewish wife named Drusilla, and Paul and Felix are often talking about some of these things. And we read in verse 25 that Paul was talking constantly about righteousness, self-control and the coming judgment. I expect that specifically because of Felix and who he was and what he's done. Eventually, however, we're told that Paul would appeal to have his case heard by Caesar himself, to which we're told in Acts 25, 12 you have appealed to caesar to caesar you will go i think we as perhaps low church christians you know without you know, bells or smells or whatever uh, often perhaps have a disdain for emperors who accept christianity and tend to think of power and religion as not good bedfellows we look back at constantine as a bit of a disaster for the church rather than a blessing but paul however i suspect is rather very eager to testify before the emperor nero about the truth of jesus as the messiah i mean who wouldn't want the most powerful person in the world to accept the truth you know the Emperor Nero at this time, probably around 24 years old, uh, his early reign, uh, according to many sources, was fairly good because of his advisors, like the Stoic philosopher Seneca. But it would be later, uh, as he has more of a hand himself in events, that his worst atrocities would take place. Paul remains with the uh, new governor, Festus, until King Agrippa comes. And Agrippa asks to hear Paul. And Paul speaks with him and we read in Acts 26, 6 and 7, Paul says, I stand here on trial because of my hope in the promise made by God to our ancestors, a promise that our 12 tribes hope to attain, that they earnestly serve God day and night concerning the hope the Jews are accusing me, your majesty. So Paul then goes on to record his encounter again with Jesus on the road to Damascus, his commissioning to go to the nations. And he recalls Jesus saying to him in Verses 17 and 18. I'm sending you to open their eyes so that they can turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, so they may receive the forgiveness of their sins and a share among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So Paul finishes with this challenge to Agrippa in verse 27. Do you believe the prophets, King Agrippa? I know that you believe. To which Agrippa replies in verse 28. In such a small time, are you persuading me to become a Christian? For Paul, the good news is that the prophecies have been fulfilled. And so he's asking his audience if they believe in the prophets. Do they believe that they're going to be fulfilled? For if they do, Paul's got good news. They've been fulfilled. Agrippa, as king of the Jews here, was charged by the Romans in appointing the high priest and looking after the temple. Uh, and Paul is trying to persuade this most important man that Jesus is the Messiah that they've been waiting for. And the proof was his resurrection from the dead. And in the words of Paul in verse 22, 23, I stand testifying to both the great, the small and the great, saying nothing except what the prophets and Moses said was going to happen. That Christ was to suffer the first to rise from the dead to proclaim light to both our people and to the Gentiles. So Agrippa informs Festus at this point that if Paul hadn't asked to see the emperor, that he would probably have just let him go on his own way at this moment in time. And from this point, we see Paul being transported to Rome via the sea and the shipwrecked in a storm on the Isle of Malta. And eventually they find their way to Rome. And in chapter 28, Paul arrives in Rome. And he meets with all of the Jews there and he explains what's happened and he calls all of them brothers to begin with. 
adding, I've done nothing against our people or the customs of our ancestors, verse 17. But the Jews replied that they don't know about Paul, or, but they do want to know about the way and about whether Jesus was in fact the Messiah. And so Luke reports that some believed that Jesus was the Messiah, whilst others refused to believe. And Luke finishes Acts with a quotation from Isaiah 6, uh, 9 to 10, to make the point that while some within the Jewish community have rejected Jesus as the Messiah, he's being proclaimed among the nations, and they're turning to him and the God of Israel. That the nations are now coming to know the God of Israel. Okay, so Paul's time in prison allows him to compose some of the letters to the churches that make up the New Testament today. And Luke finishes his word saying, Paul lived there two whole years in his own rented quarters and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and the teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with complete boldness and without restriction. Friends, a quick tour through these final chapters of Acts should help us dwell and think upon our own witness for Jesus Christ today. Can you recall moments in your own Christian walk when you've had to give a defence of what you believe and why? Perhaps it was a colleague at work or a friend or a family member. We're each to given these opportunities in life when we can share of our own hope about who Jesus Christ is and why he matters. In 1 Peter 3, 15, we're told, but set Christ apart as Lord in your hearts. Always be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks about the hope that you possess. Friends, are you in that state of readiness today? Are you ready to give an answer to anyone who asks about the hope that you possess? And if not, why not? Why not? Paul, when he encountered that bright light on the road to Damascus, had a revelation about who Jesus Christ of Nazareth really was that he was the same one who had spoken to Moses from the burning bush he was God the same one who had walked with Adam in the garden spoken with Abraham wrestled with Jacob spoke face to face with Moses on the mountain the one who Joshua had met and spoken with Samuel in the tabernacle the same person who's once again stepped into Israel's story to do something amazing something wonderful that he'd been born of a virgin of the line of David that he died for our sins according to the scriptures that he was buried and that he was raised to dead to raise from the dead on the third day that he appeared to many showing that he truly was risen from the dead and that he's now seated at God's right hand as Lord and that he will come again as judge. Just as it's been with Israel in the cloud and in the flame in the wilderness, now he's with us by the Holy Spirit. So Paul would write in Colossians 1, 27, and this is the secret. Christ lives in you. This gives you assurance of sharing in his glory. So friends, if we're excited about him, then we will want to introduce others into a relationship with him. And if we're not excited about him, then perhaps we've truly not met him and that we need to. I, for one, love the line in Luke 24, 32, that when the disciples say, did not our hearts burn within us when he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? I want to be part of that fellowship of burning hearts. In the words of A.W. Tozer, I'm looking for the fellowship of the burning heart for men and women of all generations everywhere who love the Saviour until adoration becomes the music of their soul, until they don't have to be fooled with or entertained and amused, that Jesus Christ is everything, they're all in all. Friend, does your heart burn with that love of God today? If not, why not? William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, once wrote, The tendency of fire is to go out, so watch the fire of the altar of your heart. Anyone who's tended a fireplace, fire knows that it needs to be stirred up occasionally. In conclusion, friends, the reason why Paul was so successful despite his imprisonment, trials and persecutions was because he loved God and wanted to tell everyone about him. So if you believe, if then you'll want everyone to know about it. Friends, if your fire is going out or gone out, then stir it back up. 
fan it into flame. Spend some time alone with God, seeking him, seeking his presence and listening to him and to the still small voice. Stir up your heart again into that roaring flame. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, I just pray for all those who are listening this morning, Lord, that you would be with them and you would strengthen them and help them to receive something from you this day. Amen.